This pamphlet is distributed by the Southern Nevada Alliance of the Libertarian Left. We are individualists, agorists, market anarchists, mutualists, voluntary socialists, and others on the libertarian left. We oppose statism, militarism, sexism, racism, and the prevailing state capitalism traditionally labeled the free market. We are for peaceful individual freedom, truly freed markets, solidarity, voluntary cooperation, and mutual aid. We fight for libera liberation in Las Vegas through education, nonviolent and direct action, and cooperative counter institutions, not petitions, symbolic protests, or electoral politics. We are working to build a new society within the shell of the old. Interested? Want to meet like minded people? Check out vegas.libertarianleft.org. This essay was written in the summer of 1886 and originally delivered as a public lecture by Benjamin R. Tucker, an editorial in chief writer for Liberty, then the leading individualist anarchist newspaper in the United States. It was later published in Liberty on March 10, 1888, and then republished in the first collection of Tucker's writings instead of a book by a man too busy to write one in 1893. This booklet is based on the version printed in. Uh, in instead of a book as reproduced on the fair use repository website at fairuse.org slash benjamin hyphen tucker slash instead hyphen of hyphen a hyphen book anti-copyright state socialism and anarchism how far they agree and wherein they defer Probably no agitation has ever attained the magnitude, either in the number of its recruits or the area of its influence, which has been attained by modern socialism, and at the same time been so little understood and so misunderstood, not only by the hostile and the indifferent, but by the friendly and even by the great mass of its adherents themselves. This unfortunate and highly dangerous state of things is due partly to the fact that the human relations which this movement, if anything so chaotic can be called a movement, aims to transform, involve no special class or classes, but literally all mankind. Partly to the fact that these relationships are infinitely more varied and complex in their nature than those with which any special reform has ever been called upon to deal, and partly to the fact that the great molding forces of society, the channels of information and enlightenment are well nigh exclusively under the control of those whose immediate pecuniary interests are antagonistic to the bottom claim of socialism, that labor should be into possession of its own. Almost the only persons who may be said to comprehend even approximately the significance, principles, and purposes of socialism are the chief leaders of the extreme wings of socialistic forces, and perhaps a few of the money kings themselves. It is a subject of which it has lately become quite the fashion for preacher, professor, and penny a liner to treat, and for the most part woeful work they have made with it, exciting the derisions and pity of those competent to judge. That those prominent in the intermediate socialistic divisions do not fully understand what they are about is evident from the positions they occupy. If they did, if they were consistent logical thinkers, if they were what the French call consequent men, their reasoning faculties would long since have driven them to the one extreme or the other. For it is a curious fact that the two extremes of the vast army now under consideration, though united, as has been hinted above, by the common claim that labor shall be put in possession of its own, are more diametrically opposed to each other in their fundamental principles of social action and their methods of reaching the ends aimed at than either is to their common enemy, the existing society. They are based on two principles, the history of whose conflict is almost equivalent to the history of the world since man came into it, and all intermediate parties, including that of the upholders of the existing society, are based upon a compromise between them. It is clear, then, that any intelligent, deep-rooted opposition to the prevailing order of things must come from one or the other of these extremes, for anything from any other source, far from being revolutionary in character, could be only in the nature of such superficial modifications as would be utterly unable to concentrate upon itself the degree of attention and interest now bestowed upon modern socialism. The two principles referred to are authority and liberty, and the names of the two schools of socialistic thought which fully and unreservedly represent one or the other of them are respectively state socialism and anarchism. Whoso knows what these two schools want and how they propose to get it understands the socialistic movement. For just as it has been said that there is no halfway house between Rome and reason, so it may be said that there is no halfway house between state socialism and anarchism. 
There are, in fact, two currents steadily flowing from the center of the socialistic forces, which are concentrating on them from the left and on from the right. And if socialism is to prevail, it is among the possibilities that after this movement of separation has been completed and the existing order have been crushed out between the two camps, the ultimate and bitter conflict will still come. In that case, all the eight-hour men, all the trade unionists, all the knights of labor, and all the land of the national, nationalizationists, all the greenbackers, and in short, all the members of the thousands and one different battalions belonging to the great army of labor, will have deserted their old posts, and these being arrayed on the one side and on the other, the great battle will begin. What a final victory to the state socialists will mean, and what a final victory to the anarchists will mean, it is the purpose of this paper to briefly state. To do this intelligently, however, I must first describe the grounds common to both, the features that make socialists of each of them.